Prieta. She's the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter plastic pollution prevention chair. She's also a former software engineer at NASA who holds a degree in the arts. She resides in Santa Clara County, dividing her time between advocating for a healthy environment and photography and photographing the beautiful outdoor surroundings that we have around us. So she'll be talking about artificial turf. And I think at least I'll tell you, the first time I read her presentation, my eyes opened up really wide. So uh, Susan, thank you so much and take it away. Okay, hi, it's great to have you all here. Um, so, so we're looking at this first slide. Uh, this slide is thanks to the people that um, I first talked to and that we first talked to. There are a lot of local sports uh, teams and coaches who around here, not necessarily in other places, but around here, who seem to really like playing on artificial turf. I'm not sure that's true about all of their players. But um, on the left is a world famous National Women's Soccer League uh, winner, along with her team, Ali Krieger, um, who just won the title this past mm, November. And um, on the right is international star Lionel Messi playing on natural grass, which he prefers. Okay. So most people just walk past artificial turf and don't really think about it, which is very understandable. Um, people often have that reaction to just grass in their environment. It's something that you walk on and don't really notice much. But um, uh, let's see, did I skip one? I think I may have, uh, ah, this one, yes. Um, artificial turf is plastic and plastic is a petroleum product. Um, as we know, most plastic is used once. In the case of artificial turf, um, it's uh, used for about eight years. Um, and then it wears out as teams play on it. And it has to be taken off the field and a new plastic layer or two need to put that be put down on top. So uh, even though it's sort of a single use plastic, it does last for a number of years. Uh, however, disposal is very difficult. But before we get to disposal, let's just talk about plastic, generally speaking. The graph that you're seeing in the lower left is an older graph. It's from about 2016, but it does show the trend of plastic production. Um, there was just a survey done within the past, I mean, finished and published within the past a couple of months that basically uh, says that plastic in the ocean, so on the surface and down under the ocean, is um, going up at 4% a year um, and what that means is, is that from today, in 2024, the beginning of 2024, the doubling of plastic in the ocean um, will occur in 2040, which is not that far away. Now, that is a lot of plastic. Um, plastic really is tough to dispose of, um, and uh, it's often just sort of winds up in either legal or illegal landfills. Um, and artificial turf fields have a much bigger impact than uh, people tend to think about. So um, on, on the uh, left, we have a face uh, planner, plain view look at the Fremont Union High School. I'm sorry, my pointer is a little sensitive here. Uh, Fremont Union High School football field. Um, and the map that, that is sitting on top of, that's the Sunnyvale storm drain map. So the school itself has its own storm drains and their storm drains empty into the city storm drains. And then the city storm drains, those blue lines, um, empty out into channels and creeks that all go to the bay. So anything that is loose on top of that field is going to wind up being washed into a storm drain and carried out to the bay. And on the right uh, is 
sort of the size of a soccer field. So sports fields are vary in sizes. A football field is about 1.3 acres. And a soccer field can be anywhere between 1.66 acres to a little bit more than two acres. And apparently the average size is 1.76 acres. So why is this important? You know, uh, we've all, I think, stood on a football field or a soccer field and realized that it's pretty large. Well, it turns out that um, in 2016, there were 3,892 high schools in California. So that's all the public and private schools. And if we assume that there are two athletic fields at each high school, so one a football soccer field and one a softball baseball field, then um, we can safely assume that there are four acres of field per high school. So you multiply all that out, you wind up with 15,568 acres for high schools. Um, it turns out that there are 640 acres in a square mile so when you divide 5,568 by 640, you wind up with almost exactly 24 square miles of plastic turf. So that's just for the high schools. There are middle schools, elementary schools, community colleges, universities, and then there are city parks and county sports complexes and fields. And by the time you're done, you have one heck of a lot of plastic rolled out onto the ground. Um, you could do a similar exercise for pounds of plastic. So I found the statistics that says there's 40,000 pounds of plastic on an average athletic field. Um, I won't bother to do that. Uh, I'm sure you're getting the idea. And in fact, um, researchers at the University of Barcelona ran a study where they went, there, they, there's a river that runs uh, through their town out to the ocean, they're right next to the ocean. And they collected as many plastic pieces of all sizes from those from the watershed and from the ocean, from the surface all the way down to the bottom, as much as they possibly could. They hauled it back to the school and they sorted it out by size and they counted it. And they found that half of all of the plastic they collected was from artificial turf. They actually went to the trouble of analyzing it. So when you see that line, it says chemical composition. And uh, so that's polyethylene and polypropylene are those two chemicals. And those are the major components of plastic turf grass blades. Or my mouse is, there we go, not fully cooperating with me. Um, like I said, artificial turf needs to be replaced every eight to 10 years. Uh, the warranties go for eight years usually. Um, and most of that winds up in landfill, either legal or illegal. Um, at Saratoga High School, the artificial turf field this past year was replaced with another artificial turf field. So um, at the beginning of the process, they rolled up the top carpet, put it on trucks and drove off. And a couple of Saratoga parents, Saratoga High School parents got in their cars and followed those trucks. Uh, the trucks went out to San Martin. So that's what this, slide, this picture is all about. And they just dumped the carpets right out onto a ground in a farmer's field. And there they sit. So um, I'm gonna, so about 75% of all plastic, not just artificial turf, winds up buried in a landfill and uh, less than 9%, actually the Smithsonian calculated for this past year, less than 5% um, in the United States at least is actually recycled. And it's not a real form of recycling. I mean, when you think about real recycling, you think about you know, for example, paper that you can take completely apart and make a brand new sheet of paper. Um, with plastic, things are a little bit more difficult. Okay, and I have something I've been calling faux recycling. And um, that basically means um, you take some old used up carpet or athletic turf 
and you just cut it into pieces and you sell it to people and then they roll it out in their yard or somewhere or in the garage or whatever. And that's not real recycling, but you'll hear the term used, recycling for this. Um, this is a Facebook page, market page. If, you, if you're on Facebook, you can just go to their marketplace section and put in artificial turf or synthetic turf and see for yourself what comes up. So when it comes to recycling that isn't dumping things into a landfill, you know, what does that mean? Well, there's really two types for artificial turf. And in one type, they uh, basically mechanically separate out all the pieces and they sort them by size and they wash them off. And then they take uh, parts of those and they sort of warm them up, heat them to some degree and mold them into something new. Um, the contaminants, whatever they are, stay with that item, the new item. And also every time you do this process where you just sort of break stuff into little bits and then you warm it up and mold it into something new, it gets weaker. So each new product is weaker and eventually you wind up with a single plastic bag, a single use plastic bag that you can't do anything new with. And you're kind of stuck for this kind of recycling. There's no place else to go but a landfill. Unless, and that, now we come to the second type of what they call recycling, uh, chemical recycling, which is really paralysis, paralysis meaning heat. Um, Exxon likes to call it advanced recycling. Um, the picture is from Baytown, Texas, where they refine petroleum, where they make all sorts of petroleum products, and also where they take um, used plastics and they use pyrolysis to melt the plastic down. Um, the problem is, is that when you heat plastic or mix plastics up to between 2000 and 5000 degrees Fahrenheit, um, you're using a lot of energy. You're using as much as seven times the amount of energy needed to create the plastic in the first place. So there's a little bit of a problem with that where it's certainly not sustainable, whether or not you think it's recycling. But not all of it is um, recycled. Some of it is there's there's uh, pollution of the water. You need water for this process. Um, microplastics are thrown into the air a huge amount for this process. Uh, by the way, microplastics have been found in cloud matter at the top of Mount Fuji, as well as in the ocean um, and in all sorts of other places. Um, Whatever product you do make is still going to have all the chemicals that were in those mixed plastics. There are some Norwegian scientists who just published an article um, where they took microplastics and they tried to figure out, you know, you know, what kind of problem are microplastics for small organisms and what precisely causes the problem. And so what they found was that um, the chemicals, the mixed chemicals from mixed plastics put together are the things that cause small organisms to become sick or to not reproduce well. Um, I'm not completely sure about the details, but they did some cleaning process and they claimed that in a separate uh, control, they um, used cleaned plastics that had no chemicals. And again, I'm not really sure exactly what that means. But they said that those little bits um, may cause issues, but they didn't cause the illnesses that they saw with the, with the other set with all the chemicals mixed together. So I found that kind of interesting. That's a new finding. Uh, sometimes you'll hear artificial turf salespeople try to tell you that there's no proof that their product causes any kinds of problems, you know, either with people or wildlife or whatever. However, the Environmental Protection Agency um, had took a couple of years. There were some lawsuits that took several years to go through the process. Uh, a couple of those lawsuits are now done. Um, and the EPA has fined Electron Hydro more than a million dollars and put a bunch of conditions on them because um, they certainly did not have a permit to do this. Nobody allowed them to do this, but some genius at their company thought it would just be great 
um, when they were building the dam and they were diverting part of the river um, in the diverted part to put an old artificial turf field or fields uh, to underlay the clear plastic that you see in this picture. And the water was supposed to run over the top of the clear plastic. So the old turf, for whatever reason, was sitting down underneath it. Um, and uh, right after they put this in and they let the river you know, be diverted and run over this patch, there was a storm. And that storm broke the turf into giant chunks. And those chunks went all the way down the river to Puget Sound Commencement Bay. Um, and caused problems for the salmon, fish, wildlife along that entire stretch, which is why Electron Hydro lost those lawsuits. Um, there's a couple more lawsuits that they're still in the middle of. Okay, so um, I'm sure most of you have heard about the heat island effect. So that's another thing. Architects consider artificial turf to be hardscaping. And that's because it completely covers the ground and organisms underneath um, die and the ground is dead underneath that area. It's just like pouring cement all over the ground. And in this uh, picture on the uh, right, this is a um, infrared picture taken from a Landsat satellite from 2017 showing uh, surface temperatures right along the bay at Sunnyvale. And so this area that's the reddest, it says hot, um, I, I added the word hot, but um, it was 138 degrees Fahrenheit at about a quarter to 11 in the morning on September 2nd in 2017. Um, so you can see that that region is the hottest in the whole area. And if we look at a Google map to see what exactly that region is, it turns out that that is the Twin Creek Sports Complex, which um, has, uh, I, I don't know, something like 12 artificial turf fields on it. And uh, that little picture up in the left is a picture I took I have an infrared thermometer. It is a uh, calibrated and um, National Institute of Standards um, certified. Uh, and um, I, at uh, on the end of July, the air was 78 degrees and um, I pointed the thermometer at the ground at the artificial turf in Fair Oaks and Sunnyvale. And you can see it says 152 degrees on there. So the surface temperature for the artificial turf was about um, 70 degrees warmer than the air. You may not know that um, artificial turf surfaces are hard. They're certainly harder than grass ground um, surfaces. Um, and so one of the things that uh, professional players, that professional players prefer grass because if they're going to fall while they're playing football or soccer or rugby or something, they'd much rather fall on grass, which is a little bit softer than an artificial turf field, which can be quite hard. Um, so there are statistics for pros, but one study looked at high school students. And uh, so they collected data from 26 high schools and they looked at uh, the results that were given to them to compare injuries by um, artificial turf versus natural grass, um, whether an injury was an upper body injury or a lower limb injury, uh, what kind of sport was played, whether it was you know, soccer or baseball or rugby or whatever, um, the level of competitive play um, and also whether the, it was a practice versus a competition. And the results are over here on the right. Uh, they accounted 953 injuries, 60% occurring on artificial turf, and about 40% on grass. Um, so when they were done with all of their calculations, uh, it turned out that their athletes were almost 60% more likely to sustain an injury on artificial turf 
and that the sports which are the most rugged and where people run the fastest, football, soccer, and rugby, um, they were at a significantly greater injury risk, which is probably not a huge surprise. But what might be a surprise is not only were there more injuries on the artificial turf fields, uh, they were also more severe, probably because of the hardness of the ground. Okay. Um, there are also these things called PFAS, which are the so-called forever chemicals that have been in the news recently. Um, so the first thing is, what is what is a PFAS and why do we even have them? So let's go back to plastics, which again are made from petroleum. This is just a different diagram on the left showing us how we get to the plastics from a crude oil. And then um, what happens is the mineral um, uh, fluorite is um, chemically turned into fluorine. That's not very difficult to do. And um, it is also added separately to petroleum. And you wind up with this chain of carbon and um, fluoride molecules. Um, whereas, you know, crude oil, as we know, is uh, uh, hydrogen, excuse me, carbon hydrogen chain. Um, so they put these uh, PFAS into the plastics. And what they get, the turns of plastics, they have give all these wonderful um, properties. So you add PFAS to uh, plastic and you can get stuff that's um, stain resistant, water resistant. You can make Teflon nonstick cookware, um, really slick raincoats. Uh, you can have foam. It has foaming qualities that you can put in cleaning products or firefighting foam. You can get stretchy plastics that you pull out all over food, um, and it, you can put it into carpets and textiles. And artificial turf really is a kind of plastic carpeting, if you want to think of it that way. Um, there are more than 14,000 kinds of PFAS, um, and we really only know a little bit about some of them. We don't know about the details for all 14 plus thousand of them. One thing we definitely know, though, is that to produce a single blade of um, carpeting, plastic turf, you have to run it through this machine that extrudes it, and the machine itself uses PFAS to keep the plastic from sticking to the machine. Um, the properties of the, the makeup of the artificial turf is um, proprietary, so we can't say for certain exactly what is in a, a blade of artificial turf, you know, unless we went to the trouble of breaking it down and analyzing it really carefully. But we know for sure that there's PFAS on the surface because that's how the blade got extruded from the machine. If you ever have an artificial turf salesperson tell you that there's no PFAS in their product, that it's a PFAS free artificial turf, just keep pushing them. Eventually they'll admit that there is probably PFAS in there. So why do we care about PFAS? Why has it been in the news? Um, well, they've discovered some alarming properties about, sorry, about a number of the PFAS chemicals. Um, and they know for a fact, so the the, the high certain set different PFAS. So there are quite a few of them, more than 14,000, remember. But some of them cause uh, different kinds of diseases or cancers, or they um, uh, lower um, birth weight, or they cause, they cause people to lose, um, they don't have as good an immunology response to vaccines. Um, there are a lot of problems. And uh, we don't actually know enough about PFAS to say, so there's three, I won't go into the details, but there's supposedly three basic types of PFAS. And one of them um, industry likes to say is like problem free. And that's the only thing they use in their carpeting. But we really don't know enough about it. And actually we know a little bit about that particular kind of PFAS. It acts with UV light, which is from sunlight and you can uh, actually create you remember when we had the holes in the um, in the upper atmosphere um, from, oh, now I'm spacing out, but we went through this thing in the, well, many of us are older, in the 70s when the ozone holes were growing, 
and we had to quit using hairspray and stuff that had this, this problem chemical in it. Well, it turns out that um, what industry, the artificial turf industry people, representatives like to say is the safe PFAS interacts with UV and creates that, that particular ozone uh, hole creating chemical. So um, that doesn't work really well. Um, so um, they've also detected PFAS in um, seafood. Um, remember all those plastic bits that are out there in the ocean? Well, you know, they get into the fish. Um, and they've done two different studies. And in one study, their so-called total diet study, where they just um, looked at uh, uh, food that people ate generally, um, seafood that people ate generally, whatever it is they ate, and they detected PFAS in 44% of the food samples. And uh, in, a, in a targeted seafood survey where they only looked at very specific kinds of seafood, they found that there was PFAS in 74% of the samples that they gathered. So the United Nations and um, other research bodies that have really looked closely at the problems of plastic pollution say, the place to start is to quit making plastic items that we really don't need. Uh, some plastic is going to be hard not to use, at least for a while, until there are new materials. Um, for example, if you have a stent put into somebody's artery, it's going to have plastic in it. That plastic may have PFAS, but if it saves somebody's life today, they're probably not going to be worried too much about the PFAS right at that moment. On the other hand, here are a bunch of things we really don't need to use at all. Nobody needs a, a plastic bottle. Nobody needs to eat off plastic plates or with plastic utensils. You know, you don't need that a styrofoam mug or you don't need single use plastic bags. And you don't need to roll plastic out on the ground in order to run around on top of it and play a sport. You know, for thousands of years, people ran around not only on grass, but on dirt and sand and, you know, other natural surfaces. Now I'm going to go into grass. So here in California, um, we actually do have grass stadiums um, there and grass fields. They might be a little bit harder to find in our area than they used to be. Um, but you can see them. So these pictures are from two sort of ends of the income spectrum. On the left is a very fancy, expensive um, stadium that's down in San Diego. Uh, they use that year round. So um, in January, they have monster truck rallies on it. Uh, so uh, sometimes you'll hear that, you know, you can't use, you can't, you have to like save a grass field that you can't use it for a couple of months. Um, I, I don't think you could convince the uh, San Diego State University folks that that was true. Um, over here on the right, this is a new field that's in Manteca. Um, and in fact, all the high schools in Manteca are, have grass fields. Um, and curiously, if you go up and down Highway 99, which runs down through the Central Valley, if you, you know, from Manteca, to the north of Sacramento, all the way down through Modesto, down to Bakersfield, you're much more likely to run into grass fields everywhere than you are currently where we are, which I find kind of interesting. Um, in Bakersfield, uh, I ran into one of the soccer coaches. Oh, well, I didn't run into him. I called him on the phone, but I talked to him, and he said that they put an artificial turf field in um, to use. And uh, that the players, excuse me, hated it and they wanted it taken out after about a year and a half. And so they went back to grass fields. And the reason it's not too hard to figure out when you realize that um, when they're playing in the summer and in the fall and sometimes in the spring, the temperatures there can be 100 degrees or hotter. So if you start with a temperature that's around 100 degrees and you add, you know, 70 degrees to that for the surface temperature of the, you know, the surface you're running around on for artificial turf, you might not appreciate that. You'd much rather be on the grass field. So grass is a plant 
And again, people tend to forget about that because grass is something we take for granted. We just kind of walk around on it. But grass will sequester carbon uh, through photosynthesis. It'll push carbon down through its roots into the ground. And then um, organic uh, micro microorganisms will take that carbon and use it, their own mechanisms and life cycles. And then when they die, it stays with them into, in the soil. And it'll stay there um, underground unless the soil is dug up or tilled or something. But, you know, that's true for any plant. If you pull up a tree and you dig up the soil all around it, you're going to be pulling up carbon out of the ground. So what you really want is, you know, for the plants to stay put and to be happy and to keep pushing that stuff underground. So I love this middle photograph. This is a prairie photograph by uh, photographer Jim Richardson. And um, grass, uh, if you want gr drought tolerant grass, um, grass has three sort of um, adaptations or methods for being drought tolerant. So one of them you see right here is having long roots and they poke way down into the ground so they can get moisture even when the surface of the ground is dry. Another mechanism is for the grass to actually go dormant and to turn brown. And so you can see that sometimes in grass fields. Some of the grass that was brought from the East Coast and just put into people's lawns here um, will, go, uh, will go brown over winter until the rain shows up and then it'll green up again. So that's another way. And then uh, finally, Bermuda grasses have a really interesting strategy. They don't have roots that are incredibly long um, and they don't go brown, or at least it takes a lot to make them go brown. And that is because they actually change the surface of, their, uh, uh, of the plant, the green part, and they toughen up. They become more, more like a succulent. Um, they, they slow down. They still go through photosynthesis, and they still put carbon into the ground, they just do it at a slower rate while they're waiting for water to show up. Now this picture down on the right, that's an aeration plug. And that's from, so I'm gonna say this for Lisa, that's from Springfield, Massachusetts, a city park. Um, and uh, they actually manage the sports fields there organically. So, um, you know, when I say manage the sports fields organically, I mean that they basically farm their sports fields. So just like an organic farmer will carefully manage compost and everything else to grow your vegetables, you can do the same thing with a sports field. These sports fields have been around since 2002. So they're successful. They know a lot about how to do this. Again, that's on the East Coast, so it might not, everything they do might not translate directly here, but it certainly proves that this can be done. So now we're back to the Central Valley. Um, these are pictures from sports fields at Stanislaus State University, which is in Turlock. Turlock's just a little bit south of Modesto, and uh, their fields are gorgeous and their sports manager is incredibly proud of them. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some nitty gritty about maintenance. And um, what, I, what we hear over and over again is that artificial turf fields are easy. You really don't have to do anything to them. They're just plastic, they sit there and they, they're wonderful. Uh, and you can play on them 24 seven for eight years. Um, but if you look at the warranties that come with those fields, you discover there's a whole list of things that are supposed to be done. Um, so the blades have infill. The old infill used to sit underneath the carpet and make it cushy, but the new infill sits on top of the field and is sits between the blades and supposedly makes the blades more springy by having the blades stand up. And so you've got to keep adding infill um, because the infill blows away or washes away eventually. You've got to brush the grass to get dirt and stuff off of it, dust that blows onto it, and also to keep those blades standing up. Um, 
you've got to, so they call it aerating, but it's not really aerating. It's just sort of poking down through the infill to fluff up the infill again, what they're doing. Um, and then, you know, raking does something similar. It keeps the blades from sticking together and everything. Um, and then you're supposed to also sweep the field. And on top of that, you notice this water wheel down here? You actually do, you are supposed to water artificial turf. Now you don't water it as much as you would water grass that grows. Although with drought tolerant grasses, you use a whole lot wa less water than with the old Eastern grasses that we used to have. There are, there are many new deliberately bred sports field grasses that use you know, not too much water but you do have to water an artificial turf field. They say you're supposed to, and they have uh, great big machines for grooming. So I know that sometimes turf representatives will say, oh, but with grass, you have to mow it. And that means you need to use a big machine, a mower to mow it. It's like, well, yeah, but you need to use this groomer to brush the artificial turf field. And it has, you have to run it around on the field somehow. So it needs electricity or gasoline or whatever to go. Um, And here, oops, we have a warranty. Okay, so this is a sample warranty and it's for a um, baseball field. And you'll notice this first arrow is pointing to, it says, you know, that this warranty is good for eight years, as long as you do all the things you're supposed to do, which sometimes don't get done. And then the middle part is a little bit of a surprise. It says for high traffic areas, like home plate, the pitcher's mound or right around the bases, they're basically telling you, you've got a two-year warranty. Okay, and down here at the bottom is another statement basically saying, this warranty shall become null and void if the purchaser fails to do all the steps that they're supposed to do. Okay, uh, this is sort of uh, two parts. So first I'll go through over the warranty over here on the right. Um, so I don't have a year on this warranty, so I'm not sure when it was made. But if you notice item two, it says pile of retention. So we're talking about the blades. And it says um, field turf, which is one of the major manufacturers of artificial turf, uh, it says that it's pile uh, it should, if it keeps 50% of its pile, then the warranty is, is fine. There's nothing wrong. So if it can lose up to 50% of its blades, what happens to those blades? You know, they're, they're clearly not fixed in place if they come loose and they go somewhere, but where they go is over here on the right. So that field back there, that's Fair Oaks Field. So there, there's three soccer fields there, or three. Um, there's one great big field with um, you could play three soccer games on it simultaneously. Um, and so when those bits of plastic come off of there, they can get blown, or if it rains, or you know the field is watered like it's supposed to be, that can wash those blades into the drains, there are drains along the sides of the field, and those drains connect to, over here, there's a channel of water, so it connects to the channels and creeks, and those channels and creeks go out to the bay. Okay, before I dive into costs, which is, uh, I don't know how much people here care about that, but I know that um, folks who, you know, city councils and everything care a lot. Um, but let's look down at these pictures in the lower right. Um, so this is a baseball area over here, the left side of these pictures with the red and the white and the green and the yellow. Um, and that's the area where the warranties are, you know, shorter. And um, so there are loose turf blades here. There, there's places where the carpeting is torn. Uh, you can actually sort of see a seam right here between these two spots where there's some holes. Um, the ground is not even, there are dips in the field. 
So fair oaks is a field, those fields are um, about two years old. So there's six more years to go. And there are already, you know, things that need to be done. And here's a major one. They, they did fix this, but along a seam, there was like a 20 foot uh, tear where the two sides of the seam were pulled apart. I don't know how they put them back together. I don't know if they sewed them or what they did, but they did have to go out there and put them back together. And then over here on the far right, uh, that's that brown stuff on the ground. That's um, cork infill that's been blown or washed off of the field. Right now, it's sitting um, next to this little metal piece, uh, concrete. There are storm drains just outside this fence that go down into the ground. So that's where eventually some of this will wind up. And in fact, outside the fence, if you can look right along there, there's um, infill that's in a sort of a um, a crack that's in the ground that goes along there. Okay, so now I'm gonna, um, oh, and what I was trying to get to is down here, there's this little double asterisk that goes up with this chart here. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And it basically says, if you're talking about maintenance, that the maintenance cost for artificial turf, um, we'll skip the first part about painting it and clean because these markings are permanent on this field. Um, but if frequent repairs are necessary, the maintenance costs can go up. So the maintenance is not magical for artificial turf. The chart over here on the left is a cost chart. And um, the top part is all about construction and installation. So they've got three different kinds of ways of putting in grass that are listed here in these columns. And then over here in this column on the far left, they're talking about synthetic turf. So this chart, Cornell um, uses infl an inflation index of about 3% a year. And so they keep it up to date that way because um, this chart's been around for a while. Um, and and uh, I, over here on the uh, right, um, I tried to like, you know, see if these costs were appropriate. I tried to find out how much does it cost, you know, close to today to put in either an artificial turf field or a grass field. Um, I'll get to that in a moment, but first let's look at the amounts. So for grass, the lowest cost here is $50,000 and the highest is $300,000 to put in the grass part of the field. So that doesn't include all the hardscaping or lighting or stadium seating or anything like that. This is just the field itself. Okay, and we're talking about synthetic turf, artificial turf. Um, their lowest estimate is $600,000 and their highest is $1 million dollars to put the same size field. And if we jump down here to annual maintenance costs, there's not a lot here for the grass. Um, although there is one estimate that basically says uh, $4,000 annually. And then for the artificial turf, um, they, have, they have two sources. So they have source A and source B and source A says 6,000 and source B says, and I want you to remember this num these numbers, $5,000 to $22,000 annually. Up here, it says for two acres. So, you know, you've got to keep in mind all the fields are different sizes. So here we're talking about about two acres and these are the numbers. Now I'll go back over here uh, to the right. So I looked, I looked up a bunch of newspaper articles, as many as I could find, giving me costs for fields that had been put in at certain times. I couldn't find any for grass, but I did find some for um, artificial turf. So these are between 2017 and um, 2023. And the, the cheapest number here is in 2021 um, in San Ramon for $810,000 to put in artificial turf. And the highest amount um, is actually somewhere in Kansas, which is kind of amazing, uh, but they spent $2.1 million. They don't give sizes for these. So um, at this point, I'm just looking at these numbers generally, and I'm looking over here at Cornell, and I'm saying, okay, they're not a perfect match, but they're similar enough, <clears throat> which makes me <clears throat> trust, excuse me, trust, you know, Cornell's um, estimates for grass, because with synthetic turf, they seem to be in the right area. Oh, I hope I don't lose my voice. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, 
Um, another thing that when they talk about costs, the newest artificial turf sales pitch is <clears throat> hours of play. They say, oh yes, they say it's true. Putting an artificial turf field is more expensive, but you can play on an artificial turf field 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and that brings your costs down. Because, and with grass, they say, you can't play on grass all the time. Um, when it rains, you can't play on grass, they say. Um, so this is from Springfield, Massachusetts. And remember in Springfield, Massachusetts, they have snow. So um, something that we don't get right here in the Bay, or at least nothing that sticks around. Um, and yet, so they, they say for all, these are just for the treetop park soccer field, which is um, down here at the bottom, it says estimated total hours. So that's like all of this stuff and hours per week, 68. And they say that uh, the hours um, per season, um, but these are all seasons. So for a year, they're estimating essentially a, a thousand hours. Okay, so they say that this is what they're their field size is. And if we go down here and we do the division, we say, okay, that's a big soccer field. That's 2.7 acres. So generally speaking, the biggest soccer field is closer to 2.3 acres, but you know, it's, it's loosey goosey and they happen to have one that's 2.7 acres. Um, so this particular chart was done in 2018. I performed inflation of 3% for five years and uh, did a little math and um, basically came out with, a, so for an annual amount of close to $3,500. And um, so I, I did it so it would be for two acres. And the reason is over here, they're talking about this. So this is an industry chart from the artificial turf industry. And so they're talking about something between 1.13 acres and two acres. And so for maintenance costs, they don't tell you, but this is for 10 years here. But so for a single year, it'd be $1,800 to $4,400. So $3,500 is under their high amount, um, but it is in the middle of what they've got here. Now, Remember when I told you to remember the number from the previous slide? It was 5,000 to 22,000. That was the maintenance cost um, for, uh, for an artificial turf field um, for you know two acres. Well, here, their numbers you know are 6,000, which makes some sense, but their top number is 10,000 which is under 22,000 by quite a bit. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because um, they also talk about, so the, the next calculation they make is based on the hours per year that they say are played on, on this field that they've uh, worked the math out for. And they say um, in a single year, um, they're gonna play 2,800 hours. Remember over here was about a thousand hours for a grass field. Um, there's a problem with that. If you go down here to number item number three and all the stuff I've put in here, um, if you take 2,800 hours and you divide that by days of the year, 365 days, that means they're saying that that field was played on every single day of the year for seven and three quarters, seven and two thirds hours, excuse me. There's there's no field that gets played on that much. Um, for example, the Fair Oaks field, in the spring, summer, and fall on the weekends, um, it's booked up, you know, it's played, you know, pretty much all day. But during the week, it's not played all day in those time periods. It's mostly played, those days are hot. So sometimes in the middle of the day, those fields tend to be empty. Um, and then there are some night games. And then when you get to this time of year, um, I've made a point of going over to Fair Oaks. Even on the weekend, um, there might be one or two fields empty at any given time. So they're definitely not played on for seven hours and two thirds every single day. 
So for the rest of these calculations, I said, oh, what the heck, let's you know turn that into four hours a day, which still might be high. And uh, running through the math, so I say hours per play, so that's gonna get us to $97 per hour of play. And if we look at the numbers that the artificial turf industry has up here, um, they're trying to say that the cost of hour per use based on their inflated play, you know, goes up to $46 per hour. Um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna call BS on them and say, nope, <laughs> that can't be right. Um, and then for natural grass, they have this other, this other set of numbers, which goes up to $108. So even if I'm you know, generous and I'm saying, oh sure, let's say $108 for an hour of play, you know, this number $97 isn't that far off. Okay, so six to 10,000 uh, annually, Cornell said 5,000, to 22,000 annually for artificial turf. And now this same um, company that had the same set of websites and in a different place over here, this is their sports venue calculator. Look at this, $7,000 to $23,000 a year for an artificial uh, sports field. So I'm thinking Cornell is right. And that this is their chart that they like to show to customers before customers buy artificial turf. Okay, jumping over here to the right, this is about disposal. So I mentioned disposal and recycling earlier, but in all those cost calculations that we looked at, there were no disposal costs. So if you check this out, I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but you'll see that disposal costs can be, you know, high. And if you added this in, I'm sure it would make a difference in all their cost calculations. And they have not added any of that information. The other thing that's interesting is that, um, so remember those Springfield, Massachusetts um, uh, fields that have been around since 2002, and now it's 2024. So that's about 22 years. And um, fields with the uh, grass that was put in, not the actual blades themselves, but the plants, you know, 20 years is not unusual. Plus grass has this great quality, right? It's living, so it creates seeds or rhizomes and it makes more of itself. Um, and artificial turf does not do that. So what can go wrong? So I'm going to go through things that can go wrong. And here we're going to say, what can go wrong with grass? So another thing you'll hear a lot is that we have, you know, there are gophers in California. Um, and if you listen to people who are pro artificial turf, they'll make it sound like if you walk outside of your house to a park, you're going to fall into a gopher hole and break your leg. Um, for all of us who've been outside hiking and walking and going through parks, you know that you don't see gophers all over the place. But you also know that in this area, we do have gophers. Um, over here on the left is a very large park. Uh, the city of Sunnyvale just said, um, told the uh, Parks and Recreation that they would not put an artificial turf field here, that they would keep grass. Um, and as you can see, and I've been there a number of times, there are no gophers in this park. So there's no worry. Now over here on the um, right, is an area in Saratoga. So Saratoga does have gophers. I don't know about everywhere, but it certainly has gophers in places. And uh, my friend who's here pointing at a gopher hole um, actually lives not far from, in the background, you can see the playground for an elementary school. So this field goes with the elementary school. And my friend tells me that uh, elementary school children come out and play in this field like almost every day when they can. Um, I don't know that they play organized sports out here, but they run around and surely if there was an injury where a kid broke his or her leg, um, my friend would know all about it. And she says she hasn't ever heard of that. So um, I'm thinking the gopher um, boogeyman is a little bit overblown. Now, on the other hand, if you want to, oops, sorry about that. Uh-oh. <laughs> Where did we go? 
I'm sorry, I dropped my mouse and then I lost my picture. <laughs> but if you wanted to put in a, a high school um, art, uh, sports field here, how would you go about that? So the first thing you'd probably do would be to try to get rid of the gophers in the tunnels. You'd probably trap all the gophers you could, you take them far away and release them. And then you would, um, you would dig up the ground, you would uh, take machinery over the top of that and you dig a bunch of furrows and get rid of the tunnels. And then you'd smooth the ground out again and um, do whatever it is you were going to do next. Um, after that, there, there are three general uh, sort of tactics for handling gophers, um, not just for athletic fields, but also in agriculture and other ventures. So one tactic is trapping and releasing, which I mentioned just a second ago. Um, another, and actually in New Mexico, there were wildlife specialists who went out to a high school district and they taught the coaches how to trap gophers in their fields. And they reduced uh, the gopher problem enough. They said by 75%, but I don't know what that number means. That was just in a newspaper article. But they did it enough that the coaches and the players were incredibly pleased and um, you know, wanted to give an award to the wildlife specialist who had helped them solve their problem. Um, besides trapping, there are barriers. So um, you can put in hardscaping barriers. So you could put cement all around the field like a wall. Um, I don't know how practical this is, and I am not a construction expert, so I don't know if this makes sense or not. But underneath yards in Saratoga, where there is grass, the people underneath where the roots grow um, down further, at least a couple of feet down, um, they'll put in um, a metal barrier. The cheap barriers are galvanized and that's not good for the soil, they have zinc in them. So you really wouldn't wanna do that. Um, but they're also stainless steel mesh that, that does the same thing. It's about twice as expensive. Um, and again, I don't know if it's practical, but it, it's, you know, I don't know, I guess the next time I talk to a construction person, I'll try asking him or her about that and see what they say. Um, so anyway, the second tactic is, is a barrier, but it doesn't have to be hardscaping. Uh, farmers are encouraged to grow crops all the way around the uh, field that they're protecting to grow a kind of crop that gophers don't like to pass through. There's some kind of fat grained grass that apparently gophers dislike. And so one of the tactics uh, I read about in an agricultural publication was to grow this short grained, um, short grained grass all the way around the field that they cared about so the gophers would leave it alone. Um, I'm not sure if you could really do that for an athletic field or not, but it's something to think about. And then the final way is poison. And um, you know, of course, none of us would advocate that. Other things that can go wrong. So on this slide, I have both artificial turf and grass. So what can go wrong in each scenario? So over here on the right, um, this is the surface of the Fremont High School football field, the one we saw from the air early on. And you'll notice all that black stuff. That is crumb rubber infill, which is some of the older infill. Um, they don't tend to use that anymore, although it still can be bought. Um, so that's crushed up tire, you know, and that's very bad for the environment. The old infill is supposed to sit under the carpet. So the fact that you're seeing all this stuff on top is bad. It shouldn't be there. Um, and of course, it definitely washes into the storm drains and then down into um, the creeks and everything. Um, this field is 12 years old. So this field's a couple of years older than the 10 year, you know, how old a field should be. Um, this is not an ancient field. Um, and all that stuff that we're looking at, if they replace this with another artificial turf field, all that stuff has to go somewhere and it can't really be recycled. Chances are it's either going to wind up in a legal landfill or an illegal landfill. And also you can see this place. I don't know why that was torn out, but they tried to patch it by putting some more in and there's this little hole here. Okay, this other picture is from a different place, from a different location. This is the Los Gatos Creekside Sports Park, which sits along uh, the Los Gatos Creek and just to the north of an uh, area 
uh, where there's um, a small, I'm going to say lake, big pond. Um, and um, this is from December 20th this past year after it rained a little bit for one of the first times. So artificial turf fields have holes in them so the water can pass through. But if it rains enough, you can see that um, the holes won't be enough. And eventually water will sit on top of the field. So it's somewhat impermeable. That's, uh, and also that stuff will wash things off. I, so over here on the left side, those are grass fields. Um, so the big picture is a, again in Saratoga, it's a big triangular piece of grass near Highway 85. So this is the type of grass that goes dormant um, in order, you know, in times when it's when there's no rain. You can see with the rain, it's starting to green up and it'll keep doing that. Um, you can actually play on this brown field. People think that you can't play on the field when it's brown. But that's not necessarily so. You have to know something about the type of grass and area that you've got. Um, my friend who lives in Saratoga and lives near here tells me that people come out here and play on the weekends. Um, there was nobody there when I went, um, but you know, I went maybe once or twice, so that doesn't mean a lot. Now this part, the little picture, that's actually very close to where I live in Santa Clara. And this is not a sports field. This is just a park. It's a big field area next to a school that you see over there. And uh, people come play pickup games here on the weekend. Um, and they play a lot. They played in the rain. And you can see the result. You can see all those little cleat holes and everything there. But again, grass has this magical property that artificial turf doesn't. If you, you know, give this a little bit of time, plants will grow here. Will it be perfect grass? No, it'll probably have some weeds in it. And because it's a park near me and I know how the city takes care of it, I know that they're not gonna go out there and weed this. They're just gonna bring a lawnmower by a couple of times and keep that about the same height. But I also know that you know in a month, this is all gonna be green. So this brings us to um, athletic organizations and scientific and environmental organizations, governmental organizations. So at the University of California, Santa Barbara, they have this baseball field. So over here in the Google thing, you can see where the baseball field is. Um, and this baseball field uh, has been grass for decades. Um, and they had plans in 2014 to turn it into an artificial turf field, but they didn't have the money until 2023. Anyway, where it sits is about a mile from the ocean, from a lagoon, and from the Goleta Slough. And those are all special protected areas, which is why the California Coastal Commission is involved. Now, in 2020, in, excuse me, in 2014, the California Coastal Commission approved the switch to artificial turf. But in 2023, the commission asked its staff, which includes scientists, to take a closer look at the 2014 plans and see whether they were still acceptable. And the staff came back and made a recommendation. And their recommendation was that all the plans were good except UCSB could not use artificial turf in this location. And the reasons were the reasons that we brought up because of microplastics that could wash into these sensitive areas with the chemicals and everything, because artificial turf fields are impermeable. Well, not completely impermeable because they have those holes and they put drainage under them, but they still can be overwhelmed with water at times and stuff will wash off of them. So it's the chemicals, the particles, and the impermeability. Plus something that I had no idea until I read the California Coastal Commission memo, which said that um, artificial turf fields use potable water, drinking water. The grass fields that UCSB has had there for decades use reclaimed water, purple pipe water. A 
apparently you can't use reclaimed water on an artificial turf field because reclaimed water will have salts in it and minerals and that'll interact with the turf and the UV light and chemicals in the turf in unanticipated and possibly bad ways. So that's another reason to not like artificial turf. You have to use drinking water when you wash it and you need to wash it because you have to get the dust and the dirt off. You have to get the dust and the dirt off for lots of reasons. Um, one fun reason is that I've seen weeds growing on artificial turf. Now, how can that be, you might ask? Well, if the dust and the dirt is heavy enough and you get a good seed in there, it's gonna to try to grow right there. And if it manages to poke a root down into one of the holes, it's punched into the artificial turf, it might like that too. So that's a reason why, you know, the warranties are supposed to be followed among other reasons. So we're getting pretty close to the end. I've got one more slide and then and then we'll be done. Although I've, you know, I've got a few others sitting around if anybody still has energy. Um, this is in Mountain View. So these are grass baseball fields. There's a big adult size baseball field that's about three and a half acres in size. And then there's a small little kitty um, for little kids baseball field. Um, these baseball fields are dug down about 18 feet. And that's because these fields were put in as part of a creek flood protection project. So in Europe, in the Netherlands, and some other places, um, they actually do this quite a bit or have done it in the past for a number of years. They'll take an area uh, which might be overwhelmed with water and they'll um, dig it down. And um, when, when there are no floods, and no rain and stuff, it can be very pleasant and they can have parks in there and you know playing fields and other things. But when it does rain, they have a basin for the water to run into. And these baseball fields are helping to protect 2,200 properties in this area. So what happens when this fills up? Well, it'll look like a little lake for a while but there are also holes all along, along these concrete walls. And once the rains pass, it's possible for them to control the holes to open them up to whatever size they need to drain these fields. So I love this project because it's a twofer. It's both, you know, an environmental flood control, um, you know, helping to handle sea level rise and rain and everything. And it's a gorgeous natural grass playing field. The end. I do have one more thing that I want to show you, though. This is very sad. Um, somebody is planting their yard. They're putting new plants in. And they're covering their yard with this. I frankly had not even thought about, you know, so-called landscaping cloth until I saw this. And now, besides artificial turf, which um, I'm still very passionate about, and I'm gonna keep at it because there's so much of it, you know, I'll eventually try to find out more about who uses landscaping cloth, why they use landscaping cloth, and what we can do to make people understand that plants are plants. And there are other ways to control weeds. Anyway, back to the end. Well, very good, Susan. Um, I, thank you so much for what you've done here. It's just incredible the, the level of detail you've gone into here. Um, I can just imagine a city council member wondering why they're spending all this money on artificial turf and only have to pull it up after or two or, or eight years. I'm sure folks will have questions. If you do have questions, uh, please uh, electronically raise your hand. You can do that under reactions. Um, so uh, time, time to open up for questions. Uh, Gary has a question. Gary Latchaw, please. Yes. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, 
a very extensive uh, presentation. Um, I had reason to look into this maybe a year or two years ago. Uh, one thing that uh, came about, there was a memo that was prepared within the Sierra Club, and unfortunately, they had a lot of references which were not relevant. I, I kind of reacted against that. Anyway, um, a lot of these athletic fields do use this ground up um, tires, as you pointed out. Matter of fact, I, my granddaughter played on the one at Moffitt Field, and that has additional risks, <clears throat> and those have uh, toxic metals in them that can get... Uh, you know, if the kids have a scrape or something on the field, can get into their system. Um, but at the same time, it, it has an appeal. I'm, I'll, I'll be honest. Both of my children in their late 30s or early 40s have artificial turf. They didn't ask me about it. <laughs> um, oh. they've, they've given up on that. Um, and... It does have an advantage uh, because sometimes in a home setting with fences and shading of the house, it's hard to keep a, a, a green, a healthy, regular turf lawn. And uh, I think my uh, my daughter and her husband just got frustrated and one day had this put in. Um, so there's another negative I, I, that if they have the um, the ground up um, tires, I think that that is its own problem because I saw them. They're pretty extensive. If you if you fall, you're most likely to scrape. And uh, you know. yeah, so um, as we move into a period where people talk about functional and not functional grass. Remember, California has decided that functional grass is grass that's used either on a sports field or in a community area. And so they don't want people um, to have, you know, purely decorative, thirsty grass. Um, so I'm also a member of the California Native Plant Society, and I'm uh, become aware. It took me a couple of years to learn about all of that myself. Um, but there are plenty of plants in the state of California that um, are used to our weird climate, that are used to having long periods of drought and then being almost drowned. Um, and uh, there are even some California native grasses. Uh, there's a bent, something called a bent grass, B-E-N-T grass. Uh, if you don't need to walk on it a lot, it's a really gorgeous meadowy grass. You can walk on it. You just shouldn't tromp around on it or try to play soccer on it. So, you know, and some of that will grow in the shade. There are also other plants that specialize as shade plants. So it's not impossible to have greenery and plants and flowers in the shade in California, but you have to know about it. And I understand that people don't. Um, there's another plant that is native, um, from Canada all the way down, I think, to Brazil, it's a uh, Lipia. Um, there's an, another part to that name. That's part of the Latin name. And that's actually a succulent that is one to two inches tall at the most. And that's tough enough that it can be used, for example, in an elementary school setting as an athletic field. So you can actually play soccer on that as long as what you're talking about is, you know, um, little kid soccer. It wouldn't really work for um, older kids or whatever. But I, I sympathize with your, um, you know, with your relatives, but there are answers and some of them can be quite beautiful. Um, in fact, now that you brought that up, so, you know, this is not grass, um, but this is um, a demonstration garden and it has walking areas. And these are all native plants that you're looking at. So um, you can get greenery. It's just it's just not going to be like you know grass greenery. Although again, we do have something called bent grass, which might work. Yeah, I'd like to ask um, if there are folks here who 
have any association with the Fremont Union High School District or school district to um, please get a hold of us and advocate in your local communities because uh, many people don't know about this. And I think we all, well, first, the idea that there's so much plastic in the ocean. And I read an article a couple of days ago in the New York Times that they're, they're finding uh, much larger particles of plastic inside bottled water, which many people rely on for potable water. There are plastic bits, you know, everywhere, but um, yeah, it's, it's, we really need to solve this. It's not, if we got all, if we, oh, here's a, something I forgot to say. There's a researcher in Hawaii who in 2018 um, wrote a, a scientific paper, and she's also given um, a number of talks, but apparently um, uh, polypropylene and polyethylene uh, will interact with uh, UV light and give off methane. So methane is, you know, a climate yeah, um, very problem. problem. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, please have a, a wonderful evening and please um, spread the word on this. We're going to put this up on our Facebook page and um, I can send a link out to everyone who attended this uh, webinar and you could uh, link to that page and read more about this. So thank you very much and uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was great. Thank you, Sean, very much for posting that. That's super. Yeah, uh, yeah that was an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you. Really good. We'll leave this up for a while so people can take a look at it. All right. Thank you all very much. And Sean, thanks so much for uh, working behind the scenes and keeping all this running. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good night.